Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, I have five stories for you from the Malicious Compliance subreddit. Before we start, a quick announcement that we have four new colors of the Carmen Chameleon 3D printed channel mascots going up on my dangly3d.com website right now. Along with the two new colors we released last week, that makes six new Carmen Chameleon colors in the past week and a half. Awesome. Get one for yourself at dangly3d.com or click the link in the description down below. All right, on to the stories. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from Refresh98370. Your tickets need more detail. Been lurking here for a while, thought it was about time that I contributed. As I reflected on my career in IT, I recalled this particular situation. Back in the day, I was a field tech for an IT company. My teammates and I were contracted to an aluminum mill in the upper left-hand corner of America. The place was huge. It's the only place that I've worked as an IT guy where I had to put on a hot suit to go in certain areas as part of my job. So one day I get this ticket for a computer that wouldn't turn on out at the other end of the plant. So I grab a power supply and head off in the golf cart. No joke, this place was so big, we had golf carts to get around. Important later is the fact that we used paper tickets with all the information for the call out printed on the ticket with space for use to write what was done, etc. We'd bring the resolved tickets back to the manager and he'd put the data into a wacky access database for tracking. I get out there and sure enough, the power supply is deader than mashed potatoes. I even tested with a multimeter to verify. I swap the power supply, machine powers up. I update my ticket and off I go back to HQ. End of day comes eventually, and I hand off my fistful of tickets. The next day around lunchtime, I get some of my tickets back from the manager with a note, needs more detail. I point out to the guy that there is not much more detail to be had, using the power supply ticket as an example. Test power supply, test bad. Replace power supply, PC powers on as normal. He wasn't having it though. He accepted the tickets back, but made sure that I understood that I needed more detail on my tickets. Okay, fine. Later in the afternoon, I get a call for a bad floppy drive, perfecto. I grab a floppy drive off the shelf and race out in the golf cart. Upon arrival, I do my normal test, diagnose, replace, update process, with the exception of adding excruciating details to the ticket. One, attempt read of two known good floppy disks, insert floppy number one in drive, Attempt DIR command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number one from drive. Insert floppy number two in drive. Attempt DIR command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number two from drive. Two, power down system by pressing the power button on the front right corner. Three, disconnect and remove monitor. Disconnect VGA cable from PC. Disconnect power cable from monitor. Remove monitor to safe location next to desk. 4. Remove top case from PC. Remove left hand case screw with 14 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove left hand case screw with 16 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. After securing screws in safe location, remove top case by sliding forward. Secure top case to safe location next to desk. 5. Remove failed floppy drive from PC. Disconnect power cable from 3.5 inch floppy drive. Disconnect data cable from 3.5 inch floppy drive. Remove front left screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove back left screw from floppy drive with 11 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove front right screw from floppy drive with 13 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove back right screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Slide failed floppy drive forward to remove from drive cage, etc, etc, etc. The process documentation went on like this, filling the entire front of the ticket and continuing on to fill the back of the page. It was a thing of beauty. It took me about 20 minutes to write this all out describing the replacement of a floppy drive in excruciating detail. 
At the end of the day, I turned in my stack of completed tickets to the manager with a smile and a wave. Next morning, as we do every morning, we have a quick team powwow to discuss any special items that need attention for the day, things to watch out for, things we missed previously, etc. Kind of like a scrum before there was such a word as scrum. During this meeting, the manager begins talking about proper documentation of tickets. He holds up my masterpiece and plainly states that this is a bit much. Just note on your tickets in a quick and concise manner what the problem was and what you did to fix it. Nobody ever got the business again for not being detailed enough on their tickets. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Jeffrey F. It says, Sometimes you must just give the diarrhea so they know a good thing that they had. <laughs> this works with emails too. When you flood their inbox because, heck, they wanted it, suddenly the way you were doing it seems fine now. Another commenter down below called Contraintier said, Darn, he was too spineless to go right out and say, Sorry OP, your way was fine after all. Man beat around the bush, admitting you were right. What a prideless idiot. This story is just a prime example of make sure you know what you're asking for because sometimes you just might get it. I was actually kind of surprised that the manager didn't hold up OP's ticket and just say, this is how it's supposed to be done. I can think of a couple managers I had in the past that would have said, yep, that works because they didn't want the embarrassment of saying that they were wrong. This story comes to us from Patty Cake. Want me to shut up? Okay, argue about it till you give up then I'll fix it. This is from the summer between freshman and sophomore year, circa 1989, about 15 years old. This is my best recollection of events. One of my best friends was going on summer vacation with his mom and dad, only child, and they let him invite a friend to go with him so he wasn't alone. They were headed to see the Grand Canyon, with the final destination being Las Vegas. We were driving from South Louisiana. We were riding in a Lincoln Town Car for the trip, circa 1988. This car had the type of trunk where you'd close the trunk and it would latch about two inches above the deck and then a motor would pull it down the rest of the way, tightly closing it. They would open it by hitting the trunk release, which was a button in the glove box. This friend's parents were known to argue. We'll call them Mr. Friend's Dad and Mrs. Friend's Mom. They would get into shouting matches just about anything. My friend had learned to just be quiet when this happened, but I didn't have to do that with my parents, so I wasn't used to that. They had planned to stay at little hotels on the way, and we were probably somewhere in Texas the first night when we arrived in the evening at our hotel. They popped the trunk by hitting the release in the glove box, and we got out to start getting our bags to take them inside. But when they tried to lift the trunk lid, it was still latched. My friend's dad tried hitting the release button again. He tried pushing the trunk closed again to start over, but the motor wasn't taking it down. He tried looking under the trunk lid in the two inch gap to see if he could loosen the latch manually. Meanwhile, I had an idea I thought could fix the problem. I kept trying to say my idea while he was checking all of his fixes. MFD, why don't quiet, I'm trying to think here. After he tried a couple of things, the arguing started between mom and dad. They argued about, What are we going to do? We can't get our luggage. Do we get something to break it open? But then we can't keep it closed to travel. Should we call a tow truck? Etc. I tried to give my solution and was shut down every time, ending eventually with a, Shut up, y'all go sit in the car. So we did. A few minutes later, they came and got in the car and told us, we're going to have to cancel the trip and just drive home through the night. As it got quiet and I finally felt like I could talk, I said, why don't you just use the key? There was a notable pause as the idea started to sink in. Oh my goodness, that's so smart, MFM said as they both hopped out trying the key. The trunk opened right up. They came back in the car after a couple minutes and apologized to me for yelling and told us that we can get our bags and keep going on the trip. For the rest of the trip, the motor part of the trunk didn't work to pull it all the way closed, but we were, though, able to continue. The trunk would latch and hold two inches above, being completely closed, and the key worked to open it. We just hoped there wouldn't be any rain in the desert. We got to hike into the Grand Canyon for about an hour down, which took two hours to come back up, 
and got far enough we could barely see the Colorado River in a space between two crevices. We drove over the Hoover Dam and in Las Vegas, we stayed at Circus Circus, which at the time had a kids section full of arcade games and other attractions. Every time MFD or MFM would win at the slots, they'd give us more money to spend. All in all, it was a fun trip. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Sovamind. It says, glad that you weren't fully compliant and eventually shared the key tip for them and got to continue the trip. OP responded and said, I was compliant until they canceled the trip, laugh out loud. Then that hurt me, so I had to say something. So OP, what you're saying is that the moment where you told them they could just unlock the trunk was the key moment to continuing on that trip. I think because most vehicles have gone to a key fob these days, people forget that keys are actually a thing. And how many of you with a key fob don't realize that there's actually a little key inside of that key fob for most of them anyway? This story comes to us from Ancient Educator 76. Let's go! Here's some malicious compliant as quick as it is violent. I teach in the Valley of the Sun. In the fancy part of town, I can't afford to live there. We have a new gate-to-gate -gate cell phone policy where students cannot have their phones out at all, anywhere, for any reason. If I see a phone as a teacher, I am authorized to commandeer the phone until security comes to pick it up. Fair enough. I've decided way ahead of time that I wouldn't touch a phone unless I needed to, especially during the initial confrontation. I simply say, Shmoopy Pie, please place your phone on the grade table adjacent my desk. And then I put a sticky note on it. I even make sure I only touch the phone through the sticky note as I affix it with their name on it. I then call security who picks it up. This hasn't been an issue all year. The kids are pretty good about it, but not this time. Our security guard Dave enters the room. He seems to not be able to find this miracle hot pink sticky note a fixed phone. So I reach for the phone to hand it to him. As I grab the phone to hand it the 30 inches until it reaches Dave's hand, the student runs up like the bionic man and places his hand on the phone also, grasping it tightly. I don't know why I hold on, but I do. Instinct maybe. Anyway, he demands that I let go. Let it effing go! And the second he emphasizes that word, I let go while he pulls as hard as he can. The phone flies across the room and breaks the school window, as well as itself. Both items are shattered beyond recognition. The fallout is just starting to fall, but the kid was, What the F did you throw my phone for? Crying and lying at the same time. Wonderful. I said back in the heat of the moment, Hey man, you told me to let it go, I did. This is on you, my guy. Dave couldn't agree more. His parents probably could agree a little less. Administration was, surprisingly, on my side about this. The parents did contact administration about paying to replace the phone, but they flat out denied it. They said that the student committed a bare minimum of two acts that led to his phone being destroyed. He, one, had his phone out, and two, clawed a teacher in the process of grabbing his phone, he already relinquished to his care, and finally three, destroyed a window. The fact that Dave was there to witness all this was very helpful in making sure the ultimate malicious compliance being applied had only negative consequences for the culprit. I'll never understand why he, after 10 minutes of the phone just sitting there, did decide to all of a sudden come for it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Z Edgar Hoover. It says, without getting into the is it reasonable to take phones away, here's a guess about why he got weird. Adult material or adult messaging or something on the phone and not locked. He knew you weren't going to look at it, Dave not so much. So he suddenly realized the risk he was facing and used typical teenage judgment. All right, somebody needs to explain to me why there's a full cell phone ban. I mean, I can understand having them put it away and not bring it out while classes are in session. But what's the problem with using a cell phone in the hallway? You know, for a couple of minutes, in between classes, on the kids' own time. Granted, back when I was in school, cell phones weren't really a thing. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm dating myself. 
but uh, I don't understand this one, so somebody explain it to me in the comment section down below. And if you're listening on the podcast, make sure to jump over to YouTube and comment on this one down below. This story comes to us from Ladder Station 2328. Before 9 and after 5 don't matter. I worked for a large brokerage firm in their mutual funds division. My duties included working on special projects for the controller, coordinating with the users on any issues that needed to be addressed, and working on automating all processes. I loved my job and was really good at it. As I had these various tasks, I had two computers so that I could run the programs that I was modifying while still working on other tasks. As I stated, I loved the work, since I basically did what I wanted to do with minimal, if any, supervision. Due to this, I regularly came in early, sometimes as early as 7 a.m., and staying as late as 7 p.m. I easily did two to three times the work of anyone else. I was always the first one in and generally the last one to leave. One day, I took a lunch break, which was also rare as I brought my lunch and worked straight through. Unfortunately, I had some errands to run and I ended up getting back after taking an extra 10 minutes. I was summoned to my manager's office where he reamed me for an hour over these 10 minutes. I had enough of this and I asked him if he realized how early I got in and how late I stayed. His answer totally blew me away. He said, it doesn't matter how early you get in or how late you stay, only what happens between 9 and 5 that counts. Q, malicious compliance. I stopped going in early. I would take a walk or read a book until 8.55 a.m. I would take a break mid-morning, take exactly one hour for lunch, and another break in the afternoon. I would stop work at 4.45 p.m. and clean my work area. Exactly at 5 p.m., I would shut down my computers and leave for the day. He never said anything about this as he knew he brought it on himself. All that resulted from this is he lost over five hours of work a day from me. Not long after this, I left for brighter pastures at an increase of total compensation of almost 100%. It was possible as I went to a very high-scale investment firm. Later on, I found out that they had to hire three people to do my work. Like they say, you don't know how good you have it until it disappears. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called the Old Man 1313 It says, I love these tales about managers who are so fixated on something small and inconsequential that they damage their own organization. A lot of managers make decisions to satisfy their personal needs. In your case, either control or structure, not for the good of the business. I feel that this fact is glossed over a lot when discussing economics. I don't know, OP, I kind of feel like you were putting in extra time when you really didn't need to. It sounds like you were still able to get your job done between the 9 and 5, even though you were maliciously complying with the schedule. Before, you were giving them your time and there was no extra compensation for that. I'm sure before this situation, you knew that your manager was a butthole, so I don't see why you put in all those extra hours knowing that nobody would really appreciate it. This story comes to us from MD Lapla. Workers stage a coup against the manager. Circa 2005, I switched jobs. The new job came with an awesome perk, three months working in Spain. I lived back then in Argentina. All expenses paid, earning my salary plus an extremely generous per diem. For me, it was awesome. It meant that I would get pretty much the salary of a year in three months, plus the opportunity to visit Europe and travel for the first time. The caveat was that the project was a nightmare. The consulting company that hired me had won a really big bank project and overpromised. We had to finish the project in a really impossible time frame. That's why I was going there. It was kind of an all hands on deck situation. When I arrived there, working hours were ridiculous. 9 a.m. was the starting time, and we rarely left before 11 p.m., sometimes even being there till 1 or 2 in the morning. I had no problem with that. I was living in a hotel. The only people I knew in the city were in the project as well, so we bonded over the situation. My colleagues were also really supportive. They made a point that I wasn't going to work on weekends and told me that we work our butts off Monday to Thursday, 
but on Friday afternoon, you're going straight to the airport. You have to take on the opportunity to get to know Europe. We'll get by. The problem, as usual in this situation, was the project manager. We used to call him Sauron. He was a manager that took pride in saying, I started working in this company, I met my wife because of this company, I got married because of this company, I got divorced because of this company, I live because of this company. He was middle management, so yeah. Since hours were really long and pretty much everyone was exhausted from the night before, the tech team, minus Sauron, used to stroll down to a cafe down the street at 9.15am and have a hearthy breakfast while we planned the day ahead. Team leaders were included and it was a kind of impromptu and informal scrum meeting we held. One day, Sauron and I had a meeting with the client in the office. While I was there, client said to Sauron, by the way, I'm gonna need this and that for this afternoon. And Sauron said, okay, I'll go down to the bullpen and ask someone for that. Be right back. Just keep on with the meeting and I'll join when I get back. But he never came back. The meeting finished with me and the client and Sauron never came back. After the client left, two hours later, I went down and found that nobody was in the bullpen. Not a single soul. Not Sauron, nor the team. And then, I heard screaming from one of the meeting rooms. I opened the door and found the whole team shouting at Sauron, and Sauron shouting back. Sauron was furious because the team was at the cafe. The team was furious because he had no right to be angry about that since everybody worked an insane amount of overtime with no complaints. And Sauron said, I don't effing care. You're hired to start your work at 9am. You have to be here at your desks at that time. That's what we're paying you bums for. One of the team leaders, seeing that this was going nowhere, said okay and ended the meeting. Sauron pretty much disappeared all day having meetings and such. And then, at 7 p.m., we all left. Since Sauron asked us to work the hours they were paying us to work, we finished the shift and left. And we did that the next day, and the next one as well. We did it for a whole week. Sauron missed a couple of milestones and got an earful by the client and his bosses. Sauron realized his screw-up. He became docile and never complained about anything else. Not the cafe meetings, and not even about the seldom longer than usual lunch. We did work a lot more hours than what he was paying us for, but the environment became more relaxed, and Sauron made a point of trying to be at the bullpen the shortest time possible. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Crime is Legal. It says, What a doormat team. Malicious compliance that consists of not doing free labor. Well, there seems to be a little bit of a theme between these last two stories, and I'm going to say it again. Why would you work extra hours for a company that doesn't appreciate you for it? And they're definitely not paying you for it either. You're on this team because they need help here? It's kind of obvious why they need help. Did you know that every single KCC video is uploaded in podcast form as well? Search for Karma Comment Chameleon on any major podcasting platform. Thank you for watching and listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.